I'm sorry. We're singing. Singing. They're all within 20 feet, so sorry. Uh, Okay, now that they can hear me at home. Uh, so we begin. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And our opening hymn is number 518. Christ is made the sure foundation. We'll be singing verses 1, 3, and 4. 1, 3, and 4 of uh, hymn number 518, Christ is made the sure foundation. Pay special attention to the second verse. That's why I chose it.
A reading from the first book of Samuel. All the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah and said to him, You are old, and your sons do not follow in your ways. Appoint for us then a king to govern us like other nations. But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to govern us. Samuel prayed to the Lord, and the Lord said to Samuel, Listen to the voice of the people in all that they say to you, for they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me from being king over them, just as they have done to me from the day I brought them out of Egypt to this day, forsaking me and serving other gods, so also are they doing to you. Now then, listen to their voice. Only you shall solemnly warn them and show them the ways of the king who shall reign over them. So Samuel reported all the words of the Lord to the people who were asking him for a king. He said, these will be the ways of the king who will reign over you. He will take your sons and appoint them to his chariots and to be his horsemen and to run before his chariots. And he will appoint for himself commanders of thousands and commanders of fifties and some to plow his ground and some to reap his harvest and make his implements of war and the equipment of his chariots. He will take your daughters to be perfumers and cooks and bakers. He will take the best of your fields and vineyards and olive orchards and give them to his courtiers. He will take one-tenth of your grain and of your vineyards and give it to his officers and courtiers. He will take your male and female slaves and the best of your cattle and donkeys and put them to his work. He will take one-tenth of your flocks and you shall be his slaves and in that day you will cry out because your king whom you have chosen for yourselves but the Lord will not answer you in that day but the people refused to listen to the voice of Samuel and said no but we are determined to have a king over us so that we may also be like other nations and that our king may govern us and go out before us and fight our battles the word of the Lord. Be Please join me in praying responsibly. Psalm 138. I will give thanks to you, O Lord, with my whole heart. Before the gods, I will sing your praise. I will bow down toward your holy temple and praise your name because of your love and faithfulness. For you have glorified your name and your word above all things. When I called, you answered me. You increased your strength be within me. All the kings of the earth will praise you, O Lord, when they have heard the words of your mouth. They will sing of the ways of the Lord, that great is the glory of the Lord. Though the Lord be high, he cares for the lowly. He perceives the haughty from afar. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you keep me safe. You stretch forth your hand against the fury of my enemies. Your right hand shall save me. The Lord will make good his purpose for me. O Lord, your love endures forever. Do not abandon the works of your hands. Word of the Lord. The first reading is from the second letter to the Corinthians by St. Paul. 
Just as we have the same spirit of faith that is in accordance with scripture, I believed and so I spoke. We also believe and so we speak. Because we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and will bring us with you into his presence. Yes, everything is for your sake so that grace, as it extends to more and more people, may increase thanksgiving to the glory of the Lord, to the glory of God. So we do not lose heart. Even though our outer nature is wasting away, our inner nature is being renewed day by day. For this slight momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all measure, because we look not at what can be seen, but at what cannot be seen. For what can be seen is temporary, but what cannot be seen is eternal. For we know that if the earthly tent and our lives, and we, the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. The word of the Lord.
Savior, Jesus Christ, according to Mark. The crowd came together again, so that Jesus and his disciples did not even eat. When his family heard this, they went out to restrain Jesus, for people were saying, He has gone out of his mind. And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem said, He has Beelzebul, and by the rule of the demons he casts out demons. And Jesus called them to him and spoke to them in parables. How can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a kingdom is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand, but his end has come. But no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his property without first tying up the strong man. And then indeed the house can be plundered. Truly I tell you, people who will be able to get them will say that whatever blasphemies they utter. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit can never have forgiveness, but is he guilty of an eternal sin. For they had said, he has an unclean spirit. Then his mother and his brothers came, and standing outside, they sent to Jesus and called him. The crowd was sitting around him, and they said to him, Your mother and your brothers and sisters are outside asking for you. And Jesus replied, Who are my mother and my brothers? And looking at those who sat around him, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does the will of God is my brother and sister and mother. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord Christ. Please be seated. Well, welcome home, folks. What a treat to see you all, those of you who are here and those of you who are watching from home. I'm glad that you can continue to be with us. I, I, th this is pretty exciting, I think. Um, our readings for, day, for today sort of uh, give us a, an introduction to this new era in which we find ourselves. Um, we have, you know, for seven weeks we were in Easter Tide and we were preaching about and talking about, hearing readings about uh, the presence of the risen Christ. And uh, then there was Pentecost Sunday and it was all about the Holy Spirit. And then there was, uh, there was last Sunday, Trinity Sunday. And uh, if you uh, joined with the Episcopal Church in Connecticut, as I did, with... Uh, um, and um, participated in the online service from St. Paul's in Fairfield. I think um, my colleague Curtis Farr did a remarkably good job of trying to unpack the, the, um, the mystery of the Holy Trinity. And, and I, you know, bully for him, and I was so glad I didn't have to go there. Uh, so, but today we're beginning another journey. And it's our journey during, for the season after Pentecost. This year we'll be in um, the semi-continuous uh, uh, readings from the Hebrew Scriptures uh, that are the stories of the kings. Um, we're in the book of Samuel, the first book of Samuel. We'll read parts of First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings, and then in the fall we'll, we'll get into later in the fall we'll get into some interesting uh, stories that come from the his, other history books, and um, so that preview of coming attractions, and in the gospel readings for this season, this is year B, it's the year of Mark, so we're in the third chapter, and we're just going to be picking up uh, parts of the gospel according to Mark that we haven't already heard. 
and uh, sort of working our way through that all the way until the last Sunday after Pentecost, which is the Sunday next before Advent in November. And uh, by that time, we will have made our way through, and we will also have, in August, spent uh, four weeks, I think it is, with um, the Gospel according to John, and Jesus, uh, and John's trying to unpack um, the Eucharist and the feeding of the 5,000 in, uh, uh, in the sixth chapter of John's account of the good news. Uh, and I'm not going to be here, and so someone else gets to do that. I thought, good planning. Uh, so, but today, there's some interesting stuff happening here, connecting, uh, even though they weren't designed like usually the Old Testament reading is chosen to somehow reflect or inform the gospel reading. Uh, but today it's kind of a surprise the way this mashup works. Uh, in the gospel, I mean, in the Hebrew scripture, uh, this portion of the story of, the, uh, of a pivotal moment in the life of the kingdom of Israel when the people of Israel said to Samuel the prophet, and, and uh, priest, uh, Samuel, you've been great. Nothing against you, old man, but you are old, and your sons are just, well, they're just not, they just, they just don't measure up, and uh, they're misbehaving badly, and so we think we want a king and be just like all those other people around us, all those other nations around us. We want to have a king like them, and uh, Samuel said, oh, no, you don't. And God said, be sure you tell them just what they're asking for. And don't take it personally. Um, so we heard all of that um, God told Samuel to tell the people, if, if you want a king, this is what a king's going to look like. It's going to look like oppression. Remember Egypt? Remember what it's like to be oppressed under uh, a king in Egypt? Well, that's what it's going to be like. Um, when you have a king to rule over you. And uh, so the people said, uh, thanks, yeah, right, we heard, yeah, right. Nonetheless, we want a king. Uh, we want someone in authority. You know, you're fine, but we want someone who's really in charge, who's going to tell us, you know, where to go and when. And um, so God says, is going to, that's, what the rest of this is going to be like in the, in, as we move our way through Samuel and, and books of Samuel and the books of Kings is how this gets unpacked. Eventually we're going to get to David and um, just a little bit of Solomon to see what the kingship might have been like at its worst and at its best. In the gospel reading we get a glimpse of Jesus um, and a relationship with Jesus with his family, as well as the, uh, the community around him and the leaders of the religious community. And, um, and everyone's a little disturbed by what Jesus has to say and what Jesus is doing. And, and uh, his family is concerned because, well, Jesus is uh, acting like a person with authority and, um, and doing healings and, um, uh, you, and proclaiming the gospel like no one has ever seen someone from Galilee, uh, an itinerant rabbi who, you know, sort of speaks with a Galilean accent. He didn't go to one of the posh schools. He can read and, and uh, all that, and he knows the Torah. That's fine. But, um, you know, really, he's... He's not really prepared to be doing all this. He doesn't have the credentials for that. So that, his family, put, a, uh, uh, put his family in a bad light. Because um, people around them were saying, you know, something's not right with this boy of yours. And, uh, and the people from the temple were saying, why, you're threatening us. Anyone who threatens us must be in league with Satan, the accuser. That's what Satan, I have to tell you these things. 
um, because it shows I know a little Greek. Um, Satan actually is literally the accuser, the stumbling block. It's going to, it's not, it's on its way to becoming a proper name at this point. And so he said, uh, you know, th this, they're saying, you know, you behave this way. You're, it's like Beelzebul, another name for a God who is, um, who separates God's people from themselves. And, uh, and J uh, Jesus replies by telling them this little bit of, par of a parable and saying, no, that's not how it works. If I were the accuser, then you wouldn't have anything to worry about because I would uh, be acting against other demons and, and, you know, if one demon is set against another uh, demon, then, then that's like a house of cards and it's all going to implode and you wouldn't have to worry about it. No, that's, you don't wouldn't have to worry about that. Let me tell you what you do need to worry about. What you do need to worry about, said Jesus, is if you think that you can just say anything you want about who God is and the truth of God's presence in the world, think again. Because that is a sin against the Holy Spirit. All kinds of blasphemies, all kinds of other sins, you know, we can forgive those. But to blaspheme against the Holy Spirit, to call the goodness of God evil, to say that God's providential purposes are bad, are evil, are demonic, that is a sin against the Holy Spirit, and so says Jesus. I'm, this isn't me talking, this is Jesus talking. Um, sins like that, well, that's, those are eternal sins, to quote Jesus. That's an eternal sin. That's a sin that's going to last. And you better be careful about sinning like that. Bishop N.T. Wright, in his uh, remarks on this passage, wrote, There is no middle way for the world today as for Israel in the time of Jesus. Jesus isn't just a mildly interesting historical figure, as some in today's world would like him to be. Jesus is either the one who brought God's kingdom, or he's a dangerous madman. Those who preach and live by Jesus' message must be on the alert for opposition of all sorts, sometimes subtle, sometimes threatening. And they must learn, too, how to respond. So how do we respond? Well, let me tell you a little story about how not to respond. Um, my grandfather, in his me memoirs, and I remember him telling this story when I was a boy, um, anyway, my grandfather in his memoirs talks about being on the back of a buckboard, driving a buckboard, uh, you know, a wagon with, with uh, horses, um, outside of their place in, uh, I can't make this up, folks. It, he grew up in a town called Weed Patch. It's outside Bakersfield, California. And it's just as bleak as it sounds. Um, so he'd been to a revival with the rest of his family, and uh, I think they'd been baptized. It may not have been this revival, but one like it. Uh, and uh, he was, he, they'd, they'd been preaching on this passage. And he thought, gee, if I blaspheme, you know, if I take the, Holy Spirit in vain, is something awful going to happen to me? And you know when you do something like that, what you have to do is you have to do it um, and see what happens. So he did. He said, Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit. And there were no lightning bolts. The clouds did not open. The sky did not separate. There were no, uh, you know, he wasn't turned into a cinder in an instant. And he thought, well, this Holy Spirit isn't all it's cracked up to be. And uh, he said, 
in his memoirs and in talking and telling this story on himself, he said he, he had sort of a distant relationship with God from that point on. Respectful, but not sure that God was really what God was cracked up to be. Well, when you're told that that's the kind of God it's going to be, no wonder. Uh, instead, the way, as Bishop Wright says, and we must learn, too, how to respond. How do we respond to the Holy Spirit in our lives? We respond in the words of our, former pres our current presiding bishop, uh, Michael Curry, in the way of love. Those of us who re read during Eastertide his, his book, Love is the Way, uh, Hope in Troubling Times, um, can, well, we've all got our favorite passages out of that, but the one that I'm taking away that I, with me is that if it's not about love, it's not about God. If it is about love, then it is about God. That's how we can discern between what is the truth of God, what are truth claims about God, what is it that God wants us to do and be about in participating in the life of the love of God in the world, and what's not of God. What would be blaspheming against the Holy Spirit? What would be blaspheming against the Holy Spirit is to say that God doesn't care. But Jesus is the sign for us of God's profound care for us and for all of our neighbors. And Jesus called us into that kingdom of love. That's the sort of kingdom it is, of love. And this isn't, you know, remember, this is not Hallmark card kind of love here, although that's part of it. It's, uh, it's the kind of love that wants and acts for the best interests of the other. That's the love of the kingdom of God to want and, and act for the best interest, not only of oneself, but for the best interest, acting and working actively for the best interests of others in the world, who are also created in the image and likeness of God. That's what we're called to be. That's how we respond. That's how we can discern what is of God and what is not of God. If it's not about love, that kind of active, participatory response to the love of God revealed in Jesus in the world, it's not about God. And it's not the truth. And to do anything else that says the truth is something other than that is to blaspheme against the Holy Spirit. So, what is that going to look like for us? Well, one of the ways it's going to look like for us is we're going to, you know, cut each other some slack and you all are going to be, I'm talking to Mark here, you're going to forgive me for forgetting to put the battery in the, my, my lavalier microphone uh, this morning, so that's why I'm using my outdoor voice. Um, so we're going to cut each other some slack as we go along, as we do our best to be responsive to the realities of the world around us as we come back together, to be that kind of family that Jesus talked about in the gospel, to be that kind of family of the brothers and sisters and mothers and fathers of Jesus that he talked about. And we're going to use the gifts that we have to to respond and act on that and to share that love. And just one little way that we can do that is you can see a start here on the, on the window sills is to provide snacks for the Connecticut Violence Intervention Program. This is June. It's uh, a month that we uh, take seriously the epidemic of gun violence in our country, a, uh, an epidemic that has done nothing but get worse in the last year, and we're going to use our gifts for hospitality. I mean, let's just realize that we can claim that for 
ourselves. That's one of our gifts, um, it's to be hospitable. And if, if one way we can support those who are working with uh, at-risk youth in New Haven is to do the thing that you need to do to get the attention of adolescents. Feed them. When they need a snack, say, here, have this. So in the, in the um, uh, online newsletter for June, there was an invitation to participate in this, to provide snacks for uh, the uh, youth who, are, who participate in the Connecticut Violence Intervention Program. And here's a start, and you can add yours, and uh, as they come, we'll ship some off. If you'd rather uh, to uh, let us, someone from outreach, do the chopping for you, then just mark on a check or an envelope with some cash inside for CTVIP, that's the initials, Connecticut Violence Intervention Program, and uh, someone will do the shopping for you. Uh, and that'll be a way, one way, that we can act on those neighbors who maybe we don't even see, uh, act on their behalf in love and steadfast concern. As we continue to grow in that, and, uh, and as we come back together to be uh, the community gathered together in this place under the banner of Jesus, who is the love of God in our midst. Jesus was the banner of love, the love of God when we couldn't be together, and God bless you. Uh, it, it's not like uh, in the um, epistle where St. Paul said, some might, some slight momentary affliction. Paul was being facetious. Um, he was talking about bad stuff. And we've been through bad stuff. And now we have the opportunity, thanks be to God, to begin to cautiously come back together and to be the people of God as we have been throughout these last 15 months. The people of God gathered under the banner of the love of God revealed in Jesus Christ. Amen. And now I'm going to invite, invite you to uh, find the Nicene Creed. It's on page 358 in the prayer book, and it, I don't remember if it's in your bulletin or not, but uh, if you'll find it, uh, we'll uh, uh, pray that together.
for this community, the nation, and the world. For all who work for justice, freedom, and peace. Remembering your call to be good stewards of all that you place in our care, we pray for the just and proper use of your creation. For the victims of hunger, fear, injustice, and oppression. For the vulnerable and defenseless. For the homeless and the lonely. For those who are unemployed and underemployed. And those living with addiction, domestic violence, and for all who are in danger sorrow, or any kind of trouble, for the world's ministers, the sick, the friends, and the needy. In our cycles of prayer, we pray for the clergy and people of Zion, North Frankfurt, St. John's, North Haven, St. Andrew's, Northford, Christ Church, Norwalk, and for the Church of Burma, as we pray for the peace and unity of the Church of God. For all who are in the gospel and all who seek the truth. For our presiding bishop, Michael, our bishops, Ian and Laura, our rector, Harrison, and all bishops and other ministers, for all who serve God and His Church. For all victims of violence and a special need this congregation, including all those commended to the prayers of the parish, for all who are contending with COVID-19 disease, and for all facing financial hardship because of the pandemic, and for those in your heart. Let your loving kindness be upon them. Let them trust in you. We pray to you also for the forgiveness of our sins. Have mercy upon us, most merciful Father. In your compassion, forgive us our sins.
Valentine to come forward for a presentation. I'll never forget, Lauren, the Halloween Howler when you sang from um, Frozen and just everybody's eyes were at the top of that. It was, it was, I mean, there's a lot of that that I don't remember, but I, that I do. That was very memorable. Thank you all and God bless you on your journey. So, friends, this is what our... Um, formation program for our young people. We're celebrating and we will be celebrating more th those others that, uh, who, have, uh, uh, who have graduated that Jean mentioned. Uh, but I have a, it's the reason we have a director for Children and Youth Ministries and I'm uh, Rhoda Zeller. If you would come up. Uh, I'm so excited to be able to present to you uh, our next director for Child and Youth Ministries, Dorota Zeller, who will be joining us. Hello, everyone. My name is Dorota Zeller. I live in Madison, and I'm so excited for this new chapter for me. Thank you for inviting me to your community, and we'll stay in touch. Well, we yes. certainly will, because there's all kinds of stuff to start happening this summer. Yes, we'll be busy this summer, so I'm very excited. Yeah, Thank well, you. great. Uh, we haven't put the day on the calendar yet, but uh, you can expect to see an announcement about Vacation Bible School sometime in August, and so uh, uh, Dorota will, uh, that will be her first uh, task to get that done, and uh, um, before that, though, uh, in, um, on the 21st, 22nd, and 23rd of June are, is the Youth Mission Challenge for this year. So high school uh, graduates, uh, current students, and rising freshmen are all invited to participate in that. And there'll be more. It's a Monday through Wednesday program uh, in the mornings. 
And so there'll be uh, announcements about that uh, coming out real sh soon. Um, so be sure you have that on your, on your map, on your calendar, and your map. Um, after this service, well, let's talk a little bit more about, <coughs> excuse me, my mouth has gone dry. Um, let's talk a little bit more about how we're going to proceed uh, with communion here um, after the uh, offertory. Uh, um, I'm going to um, uh, bless bread and wine, but we're only receiving the, the bread, the wafer, and that will be distributed here at the children's altar. Um, Marsha Brown is going to be our traffic cop, and she's going to, you notice you're sort of in staggered lines, so she's going to invite uh, one line and then the other and then the next pew and the next pew back to come up the center aisle and then go over here and then return. Um, you all can return by this aisle and those over there can return by the far aisle and uh, to receive there. Those of you who would like uh, to uh, do a spiritual communion, the prayer is in your bulletin and um, Julie Harris is going to be leading that for those of you here and those at home who'd like to do that. Uh, the wafer, communion in one kind, is, um, as the prayer book says, is full communion. Um, you know, we're, we're taking this cautiously and step by step. I don't think anybody is back to uh, sharing the cup just yet. So that will, that'll happen eventually, I, I trust. But for right now, um, we'll be uh, sharing the, the body of Christ in the form of just the wafer. So after that, and uh, we've said our prayers and concluded here, then uh, we'll reconvene in the garden for the annual parish meeting. And I would encourage you all to unless you need to use the restrooms, and which are this way, of course. Um, if you just want to go out to the garden, I'd encourage you, the fewest steps are if you go out that way. In fact, there are no steps if you go out that door um, and then walk around the side and through the gate and then get your uh, box lunch, find a, a place with some other, uh, you know, reasonably friendly looking people and, um, um, and, and you can, uh, don't have to wait uh, for the, that to be blessed. And uh, uh, then we'll, once we're all out there and we've, some of you are well into your lunch, uh, at some point we'll take a break to, um, uh, to do the business we need to do uh, as the for the annual parish meeting. So that will be happening in the garden right after um, this service. Um, now, I'm wondering what else I need to announce, right? Oh, birthdays and prayers, thank you. Yeah, birthdays and anniversaries. Are there, I know there are some people with birthdays and
and guide them wherever they may be. Strengthen them when they stand. Comfort them when discouraged or sorrowful. Raise them up that they should fall. And in their hearts, in your peace, which passes understanding, provide all the days of their lives. And this we pray through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And you want to... Then, for our anniversaries, uh, Tony and Susan Lynn and Paul and Rhoda Pippen. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Um, so we're all in the, yes. in the screen here. That's good. Oh, God, you have so consecrated the covenant of marriage that in it is represented the spiritual unity between Christ and his church. Continue, therefore, to send your blessing upon Paul and Rhoda and Susan and Tony as they continue to sow love, honor, and cherish each the other in faithfulness and patience, in wisdom and true godliness, that their home may continue to be a haven of blessing and peace. And this we pray through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. So, happy birthday. And happy birthday.
Jesus, I cannot now receive you at the altar of the church in the sacrament of your body and blood. Yet in spirit, I would join myself with all those who in your holy church offer you the sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Visit me, I pray, with your mercy, pardon, and blessing, and fill me with faith and love and repentance, and so strengthen and sustain me by your grace that I may be 